Okay. And I think we have a question, don't we? Well, some of them will. I mean, yeah, some of them will. Um, we're going to start talking about this stuff next week, by the way, as we begin to get into the Victorians. But remember that we're going to be taking one of the issues that in our text will be raised as the Victorian issues. And uh, if you take something like industrialism, progress or decline, or questions about science, and religion and so on and so on. I mean, these things are either directly or indirectly being talked about by some of these writers. So there will be some carryover, and we can be talking about that more as we go along. You know, for example, somebody I'm, whom I'm just about to talk about in just a, a few seconds, Mary Shelley. Uh, Mary Shelley was the author of Frankenstein, as I guess everybody knows and which we have in our textbook. And uh, that raises, in a very interesting way, lots of ethical questions about science. You know, I mentioned this one time before. Uh, just because you have the scientific knowledge and technological capability to do something, should you do that thing? Is it ethically responsible to do that thing? And there's some very, very interesting questions that come up. And of course, in her novel, it comes up uh, because, in her no by the way, she's married to Shelley. So, I mean, she's very much in the midst of this group of people whom we're studying right now. And uh, of course, what the basic uh, theme of that plot is, is that here we have this scientist who figures out a scientific way of creating life with, of course, terrible consequences. So it raises very interesting questions, not so much about science as about the ethics of science. So um, we can talk more about though, that, though, as we go along. Now, if we can go to the tablet, please. Can we go to the tablet? Great. OK. Somebody asked me a question about these relationships, so I thought I would draw them out here over the break. William Godwin, I mentioned before we took our break, was a very famous and very influential radical, political, and social thinker of the late 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century. He married another very great and very famous radical of the time, Mary Wollstonecraft, who probably nowadays is even better known than Godwin because her vindication of the rights of women became one of the principal texts defending the rights of women in the 19th century. Among their children, was a Mary Wollstonecraft, who, as it happens, married Shelley and became, therefore, Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley, or sometimes simply Mary Shelley. And so, uh, since I realized that that could be a little bit confusing, I thought that it might be helpful if I actually drew that out in this way, in this little diagram. And the Shelleys were part of a group, first of all, around Godwin and Mary Wollstonecraft, and then later on with Byron and others in Italy. And <clears throat> it was when they were in Italy, by the way, that they were playing a kind of game and uh, people were going to oh, produce a, a story. And so Mary Shelley produced her story. And her story was the story of Frankenstein, 
which apparently was based on a nightmare she had. And then she expanded on that and, of course, eventually developed it into the novel, which, of course, has become very famous and we've had numerous film versions of it uh, in modern times and it continues to be a famous work. By the way, if you've seen some of the movie versions of Frankenstein and then go and actually read the book Frankenstein, you're probably going to be surprised. It's, it's a much more interesting book than many of its film adaptations would make it out to be. So, okay, well, having said that, let's uh, go back to Shelley, the poet Shelley, for just a few minutes. I wanted you to just look once again and think about that song, Men of England. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Shelley was a great radical in his day, and obviously in his time this would have been a very radical poem, just as Blake's chimney sweep poems would have been very radical in his time. And also, of course, Blake's uh, Little Black Boy would have been as well. So notice what he's saying to the men of England is you working people of England are being exploited by this new system which is coming into play. And you are the hands in the factory, to use Dickens' famous term, which we're going to be looking at a little bit later on when we get to Dickens' novel, Hard Times. You are the hands who are actually producing all of these goods and all of the great wealth of England. So why aren't you not only getting, but why aren't you demanding your share of this? And so in the very beginnings of a labor movement in the early 19th century, Shelley, while he was not a working class guy himself, became a kind of spokesman for those aspirations. And as I mentioned, this poem of his was set to music and now is sung at labor union meetings in England. Okay, right after that in our anthology is another one. I mean, I just want to give you a sense of the other side of Shelley, because sometimes we think of Shelley as this, you know, guy who's got his head up in the clouds, you know, simply thinking about the awful spirit of beauty and clapping his hands in ecstasy over it and so on. Shelley also had this other side to him, very critical, even politically critical of his society. England in 19, excuse me, in 1819, an old, mad, blind, despised, and dying king. This is George III, as the note points out. Uh, Americans, of course, know George III because he's the George who is addressed in the Declaration of Independence. An old, mad, blind, despised, and dying king. Princes, the dregs of their dull race. Princes, the dregs of their dull race. I mean, this is no bowing down before monarchy, is it? Who flow through public scorn, mud from a muddy spring. That's what the monarchy is here for Shelley. Mud from a muddy spring. Rulers who neither see nor feel nor know, but leech-like to their fainting country cling, till they drop blind in blood without a blow. A people starved and stabbed in the untilled field. An army whom liberticide and prey makes as two-edged sword to all who wield, golden and sanguine laws which tempt and slay, religion Christless, godless, a book sealed, a senate 
time's worst statute unrepealed, are graves from which a glorious phantom may burst to illumine our tempestuous day. Well, this is anything but acquiescent in the status quo, the political status quo. Uh, this would have been somewhat unusual in how strong it is. It's not that there weren't people who, who criticized the monarch or even criticized the institution of monarchy at this time, but there are a few who would have been uh, this blunt, you know, and, uh, you know, used this kind of even violent imagery to describe what he believes is a corrupt system that badly needs to be changed. And of course, that's in 1819 that he's writing this. Okay, let's look at one other Shelley poem very, very quickly, if you'll just follow me back over. Uh, this is right after the Hymn to Intellectual Beauty, Ozamandias. Famous poem, famous poem. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them, on the sand, well, I'm having a little trouble with the uh, pages here. Near them, on the sand, half sunk a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read, which yet survive stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal these words appear, my name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. And again, while this is not a direct critique of the English monarchy, notice that it is really about how the mighty can be brought low. So, um, let me just say one final thing about this, that while Shelley tended to confine his political activities mainly to speeches, poems, uh, that sort of thing, writing pamphlets and so on, uh, for which he got himself into trouble, you may have read that uh, he got himself expelled from the University of Oxford for a pamphlet that uh, he published and got himself into all kinds of difficulty with his family as well as a result. But uh, his good friend Byron, and they were good friends for quite a number of years, so they unfortunately had a bit of a falling out uh, toward the end of Shelley's life. But Byron uh, actually held a kind of service, uh, not a conventional religious service, you can well imagine, from Byron, but nevertheless a kind of memorial service for Shelley after he died in a boating accident. And Byron held this on the shore. But Byron actually was a political activist. You know, I mentioned when we were talking about Byron that he served in the House of Lords, at least briefly, and defended uh, certain uh, liberal and radical causes of the time, which don't sound so terribly liberal and radical any longer. But he also, late in his life, he didn't live that old, by the way, but uh, late in his life, he went to Greece and he devoted himself to the Greek Revolution. And it happens that the revolutionaries were not very well trained and they weren't very well uh, equipped. And so Byron reached into his own purse and helped 
to clothe and feed and equip the troops. And he also learned how to train them. And he developed all kinds of interesting leadership abilities that nobody ever would have expected from Byron based on his earlier life. And he really dedicated himself to this to the point where he totally wore himself out. He eventually contracted a fatal disease and he died there. And to this day, he is regarded as one of the great national heroes in Greece by the Greeks themselves. So, interesting kind of background for some of these guys. Yeah. Okay, you're going to jump up there to a microphone? Thank you. Okay. Yeah, just press the button. Um, at the time of these writings, uh, what was the political prosecution or persecution uh, that somebody would face? And was there any? So whenever Shelley puts out these pamphlets and whatnot, is he facing jail time? Or is it already past that point where political unrest is? He could... He could face jail time, but somebody as well placed as he was probably wouldn't. Probably wouldn't. I mean, if you actually came out and advocated uh, that people take up arms and violently overthrow the government, yes, you probably would have been thrown into prison. But somebody who uh, was simply critical of the government uh, would not very likely have been thrown into prison unless it was in time of war, and then possibly, yes. Uh, Shelley got himself into all kinds of trouble for various reasons uh, at one time. And, and by the way, this had to do with uh, the morality and the social mores of the time, not, not just the politics. Uh, Shelley was married to another woman before he uh, met Mary Shelley. And some of you may know this story if you've read the, the head note here in the anthology. And after a while, things did not work out very well in their marriage. And you have to put this in a certain kind of context. While it was possible to get a divorce at that time, it was extremely difficult. And it was also quite rare to get a divorce and it required a lot of money and a lot of effort and the only grounds on which you could get a divorce would be on the grounds of adultery. And so uh, who wanted to go to court, you see, and uh, you know, make accusations of that kind and then you had to have witnesses and co-respondents and all the rest of it and there would just be a huge scandal. And so when people separated, they usually did what Byron did. They would have a kind of legal separation so that the parties would have, you know, some kind of legal security, even though there wasn't a formal divorce as such. Well, then Shelley took up with, uh, with Mary Shelley. He was quite young, by the way, and that was part of the scandal. And uh, they really pretty much had to leave England. And so they went abroad. And then Shelley, being the, the kind of idealist he was, invited the woman who was still technically his wife, even though they were separated. He invited her to come and live with Mary and himself as a kind of sister. And, uh, yeah, I know, it's all a very interesting kind of relationship. And then when Byron showed up, it became even more interesting. But, the, uh, but then what happened was that, that uh, Shelley's wife died so that he was then free to marry Mary. And so he and Mary married but uh, they had simply been living together up to that time. And, uh, you know, that would not sound like the sort of thing that would make front page newspapers in 2004 or five or six or whatever, but uh, in, you know, the beginning of the 19th century, that was scandalous indeed.
especially for a public figure. So, okay, well, let's turn next to John Keats. And what I'd like to look at, first of all, is his notion of negative capability. Now, let's, let's go to the text. Let's go to the text. And I'm going to explain through the text the points that I'm writing up here on the screen. This is his letter to George and Thomas Keats. His letter to George and Thomas Keats. And you'll notice that there's a lot of uh, chit chat early on in the letter. But the part that I want you to pay special attention to is, oh, about 20 pages or 20 pages, about 20 lines or so into the letter where he says, and at once it struck me what quality went to form a man of achievement, especially in literature. You see where I am? Okay. In the seventh edition, this is on page 889. And it's down toward the end of the page. For those of you who are using another edition, obviously it's going to be, you know, the pagination is going to be a little bit different. And at once it struck me what quality went to form a man of achievement, especially in literature, and which Shakespeare possessed so enormously. Now I've mentioned this here before briefly that there was a tremendous rise of interest in Shakespeare among the Romantics. And Coleridge became one of the greatest Shakespearean critics of all time. Gave a series of lectures on Shakespeare, which fortunately have survived from the notes of people who were present. And they've been reconstructed by a Coleridge scholar so that we can now have them. But that set of lectures was enormously popular and powerful and influential on the whole history, not only of Shakespearean criticism, but of the way in which Shakespeare is performed as a play. Okay, now, here's Keats, also caught up in what sometimes was called bard -olatry. Bard Olatry, you know how Shakespeare is often referred to as the Bard, as in the Bard of Avon. Bard Olatry. And which Shakespeare possessed so enormously. What is the quality? I mean negative capability. That is, when man is capable of being in uncertainties, mysteries, doubts, without any irritable reaching after fact and reason. Coleridge, for instance, would let go by a fine isolated verisimilitude caught from the penetralium of mystery from being incapable of remaining content with half knowledge. Okay, let's take that apart. Negative capability. First of all, such a person of genius, according to Keats, would not strive for definite answers to complex problems. You know how there's always a temptation to want to simplify something, to give a simple answer to a very, very difficult and complex problem. Okay? Oh, that's such and such. Oh, that's just X, or it's just Y, 
and so forth, whether it be in politics or religion or philosophy or discussions of history or whatever. Okay, so according to Keats, someone like Shakespeare has the capability, this is a negative capability, in other words, to hold himself back. That's what negative capability means. That's what's negative about this capability, is his ability not to jump to definite answers to difficult and complex problems, but the capacity to hold himself back from that temptation. And he says, by the way, Coleridge couldn't hold himself back from the temptation. Remember the point that we made at the end of the Rime of the Ancient Mariner based on Coleridge's report on a dinner conversation in which there was a person at the dinner who said to Coleridge, you know, I really wish that your Rime of the Ancient Mariner had had more of a moral. And his response was, I think the problem is rather that it has too much of a moral. And we looked at those concluding stanzas where he's really beating us over the head with the moral of the whole poem. That is not negative capability. Okay? So, here's Keats. Secondly, it's a capacity for dealing with the indefinite and the mysterious. In other words, the ability to live with a certain amount of uncertainty. Now, many people really, really, really feel uncomfortable about living with lack of clarity and uncertainty. They want things definite, they want things clear, they want things outlined, right? It makes everybody a lot more comfortable. However, what Keats is saying is that the person of real achievement is going to have the capacity to hold back from jumping for the simple explanation and to be able to live with indefiniteness, lack of clarity, even mystery. Okay? Yeah. Obviously, such a person will not win very many elections. Uh, <laughs> as a matter of fact, that's what some candidates, uh, including one that I could mention but will not, uh, have been criticized for, is that the person doesn't come out definitely enough and clearly enough for some people, at any rate, to state exactly what his positions are on very clearly defined issues. Well, that's precisely what Keats says is a terrible mistake if you want truly to be a person of achievement. Okay, Th because truth ultimately is going to be united with beauty and that's something which can't be pinned down. That's something which can't be pinned down in terms of neat categorical definitions. Okay, now let's look at a couple of Keats's own poems. To what extent does Keats really live out his own dictum? To what extent do we find negative capability in his own poems? Or is this something that we can really apply in a kind of practical criticism at all, however interesting it might be theoretically. Is it practical in criticism to think about negative capability? Well, let's look first at Ode on a Grecian Urn. You've seen these urns, right? 
in our own museum here in Houston, uh, the Museum of Fine Arts here in Houston, we have uh, some Greek urns and also in the Menil Museum, there's some Greek urns. And I'm sure you've seen pictures of lots of these. Uh, there are museums, for example, the Metropolitan Museum in New York, which has a very good collection of Greek urns. Uh, probably the best collection in the world is in the British Museum in London. And of course, we know that Keats actually went and saw some of these. And so he's going to write a poem now, his ode, which is typically a celebratory poem, a poem celebrating something. In ancient times, it could be the celebration of the victory of a general or of an Olympic athlete. There are lots of very famous odes to athletes in, in ancient Greece. Okay, Ode on a Grecian Urn. Thou still unravished bride of quietness, thou foster child of silence and slow time, sylvan historian who canst thus express a flowery tale more sweetly than our rhyme, what leaf-fringed legend haunts about thy shape? of deities or mortals, or of both in Tempe or the, wall, or the dales of Arcady. What men or gods are these? What maidens loathe? What mad pursuit? What struggles to escape? What pipes? What timbrels? What wild ecstasy? Well, what we're about to see, and we're just beginning to get intimations of, is what this poem is really all about, is not simply the Grecian urn. And if you've seen Grecian urns, well, let's see. Let me uh, try my hand at drawing here. Okay. Let me, uh, we're gonna go to the tablet here in a second. Okay, we got a, okay, great. All right, a Grecian urn. Oh, I have to go back to this thing, okay. A Grecian urn typically will look something like this. Don't expect any great drawing here, by the way. Um, this is just to give you an idea of what it is that Keats is looking at. Okay, so here's the urn, and it could have been decorative, but it also could have been uh, utilitarian in some sense. I mean, it could have been used to put, you know, some kind of food or drink or whatever in, and uh, perhaps for storage purposes. But you will notice that the urns typically have bands around them. And in these bands, let's just assume that what I'm doing is I'm doing floral, floral patterns in this band. And then we're having, these are, these are branching trees here. And, uh, you know, some other kind of figures down here. And then in here we've got someone who is pursuing someone else, and so on, okay? We're gonna have, you know, whatever going on in the different bands. But as, as he goes through, in my silly little drawing here, as he, as he goes through, what he's looking at is he's looking at the different bands on the vase or the urn, right? And, uh, like in one band, there would be a floral motif. And then on another band, there could be people, okay? 
Uh, and then in another band, there might be another kind of maybe grapes or, you know, because it may be the urn was originally designed to, to hold wine. Okay, so maybe there would be some kind of grape vine motif. And then maybe another band in which there would be more people with a scene described. And you've seen some of these where they'll have warriors. And the warriors will be, you know, using their spears or their swords and so forth and going after one another. But there are all kinds of other motifs that are used in the, uh, the various bands of these urns. Some of them, by the way, being uh, put in back corners so that uh, most people will never see them unless they know where they are because they'll have all kinds of sexual activities being depicted on here. The, the Greeks didn't have the same notions that we do and thought that you know all of the activities of the body were natural and healthy, and therefore, why should they be hidden away? So, and even celebrated, you know, in, in art. Well, anyway, so let's look once again. Thou still unravished bride of quietness is going to be both the urn itself and a figure on the urn. Because what we're going to see is that on the urn, are plants, well, obviously images of plants, that never fade. In the natural course of things, what happens? Plants flower in springtime, they mature in the summer, and then in, in the fall, they begin to wilt and you know, the, in some parts of the country, uh, the leaves turn different colors and so forth. And then in the winter time, they seem to die off, with the exception of some evergreens, but then to be reborn again. But there's this constant sense of flux, of movement, and of change in the world. But what happens when you paint vegetation? flowers, trees, grapes, whatnot. There they are, they are frozen in time. They are changeless. They are made changeless by art. So that's part of what's going to be going on in this poem. It's a meditation on what art does to an otherwising, uh, to an otherwise changing nature constantly changing nature. Okay? Also, how does art represent something which is in motion? Now that has been a very, very interesting and serious artistic, one might even say aesthetic problem for as long as people have been drawing, probably. Think about that. You know, what do you do? You want to have, say, a piece of sculpture which represents some kind of violent action, violent motion. And yet, the very nature of a sculpture is that it's going to be standing still, right? It's made out of stone generally speaking. I mean, I know sometimes we can use other materials, but let's say stone. In the 18th century, there was a famous work by a philosopher aesthetician named Lessing, and it was entitled Lockowin. Now, Lockowin, you don't have to remember this, by the way, but Lockowin was a figure in ancient epic about Troy, you know, Homeric and Virgilian epics about Troy and the fall of Troy and the aftermath and so forth. Uh, and you remember the story of the Trojan horse, the famous story of the Trojan horse. Well, you know, the Greeks have had the city of Troy under siege for nine years, actually over nine years, and they haven't been able to defeat the Trojans because they haven't been able to breach the walls of Troy. So, 
what do they do? They come up with the scheme of the Trojan horse, bringing that supposedly is a gift signifying peace between their peoples to the Trojans. And of course the trick is that inside this large wooden horse are some Greek warriors who once the Trojan horse is brought into Troy, the gate shut behind it, everybody goes to sleep, these guys will come out of the Trojan horse, open up the gates of Troy, and the whole Greek army will come pouring in. Well, there was only one Trojan who advised against bringing this in, and who made the famous uh, statement which goes down through 2,000 years of, actually more than 2,000 years, of our, uh, of our literary history, fear the Greeks when they come bearing gifts. Which, by the way, is, if any of you are Greek or of Greek ancestry, this is, you know, I'm not saying anything about Greeks here. It's simply about the Trojan War, okay? Uh, fear people who come bearing gifts. Enemies who come bearing gifts, really, is what it's about. Okay, well anyway, uh, it happens that the gods have already decided under high Zeus that the Greeks are going to lose the war and the, excuse me, the Trojans are going to lose the war and the Greeks are going to win. So naturally the gods therefore do not want for Lachlan to be heeded by his fellow Trojans. They want the Trojans to take that horse into the walls of Troy. So they send these huge serpents out of the nearby river that come up and they wrap themselves around Lachlan and his two sons and drag them off into the river where they are drowned. Okay, why do I go through this long discussion of that? because there's a famous statue of Lachlan. And here is this nude male figure, large figure, with two other nude male figures who are smaller because they're boys. And they have these serpents wrapped around them and they're in the middle of a death struggle against these serpents, okay? Now, here is something very dynamic and very violent and very much in motion, except it's carved in stone, right? So part of what Lessing is meditating on is the relationship between the static, that which stays the same, and the kinetic, which is that which is in motion in art. And how in a static medium, something which doesn't move, can you create the sense or the illusion of movement? That was a very, very interesting problem. And of course, much 19th century art was devoted to the solution of that problem. Think just for example, of Impressionist paintings. I mean, what do you see when you look in uh, Impressionist paintings? You see the effort in a static medium, and that is to say static means that things don't move, okay? Uh, in a static medium to create some kind of kinesis or movement. I'm thinking, for example, of one painting, which is a painting, uh, I think it's of the Luxembourg Gardens in Paris. And you're looking on a summer day across uh, a stretch of land, and then there's some water, and then there's some land again on the other side. And people are out in the park, it's like on a Sunday, you know, and they're, they're out there, the women have their parasols, and people are walking around, and kids are playing, and so forth. And it's painted in such a way that as you look across the water, it's a hot summer day, the light seems to shimmer. You know how the light shimmers in the heat? 
the light actually seems to shimmer. Or you have some of the famous uh, water lily uh, garden paintings of Monet, in which there seems to be almost a kind of shimmering quality to the light. Okay, or paintings of the Cathedral of Notre Dame, you know, at dawn, in which there's a kind of shimmering or movement of the light, or at least it appears that way in the painting. And people actually experimented to try to figure out ways of creating that sense of motion in an otherwise static medium. And that was one of the things that absolutely blew people away when they came up with moving pictures. Moving pictures. Can you imagine anything like that? A moving picture was, it appeared, the solution to the ancient problem of how you bring together a static medium and put it into motion. Because, of course, as you know, what you have when you look at a moving picture is actually a series of static images, right? And there are lots of very early experiments, 19th century experiments, with that. Okay, there's the famous one, by the way, of the uh, series of photographs of a nude man who is running and jumping, okay? Well, did you ever have one of those little uh, books when you were a kid where you would riffle the pages? Are those still around? I know they were when I was a kid. Uh, you'd riffle the pages, and of course, if you looked at any individual page, the image would obviously be static. It would be still, it would be unmoving. But when you riffled the pages, you would see this figure moving, doing whatever it was doing. Okay, jumping up and down or throwing balls or whatever. Um, okay, so all of these were experiments in putting together in a work of art in which one is confined, it would appear, at least so far, to static images, but in such a way that you can create the illusion of motion. So that a movie film, of course, consists of stills, right, which are sent through the, uh, the, the projection mechanism at the proper rate of speed so that our eyes register them as moving in normal ways. But you'll remember in early movies, and you've probably seen pictures of early movies, they would be very jerky in their movements because they hadn't really worked it out completely yet. Okay, now, having said all of that, what does that have to do with Keats? Well, let's go back to the Grecian urn. Thou still unravished bride of quietness, thou foster child of silence and slow time. Okay, the urn itself is a foster child of silence and slow time. Sylvan historian, because what's going to be on this is a scene from antiquity, okay? Sylvan has to do with, uh, the Latin word silva means forest, means forest or woods. Sylvan historian, who can thus express a flowery tale more sweetly than our rhyme. What leaf-fringed legend, remember my little drawing? the leaf-fringed legend around one of the bands, haunts about thy shape of deities or mortals or of both in Tempe or the Dales of Arcady, out of Greek mythology. What men or gods are these, what maidens loathe? Loathe for what? Well, we're going to see in just a moment. What mad pursuit, what struggle to escape, what pipes and timbrels, what wild ecstasy being represented on the bands of this urn. Herd melodies, 
are sweet, but those unheard are sweeter. That's very interesting. What on earth is he talking about here? Therefore, you soft pipes play on. See, there's somebody playing the pipes depicted on the urn so that there's a melody, but it's an unheard melody. An unheard melody. Not to the sensual ear, but more endeared pipe to the spirit ditties of no tune. Oh, excuse me, no tone. Fair youth, beneath the trees thou canst not leave thy song nor ever can those trees be bare. Okay, on the urn, the fair youth can never leave his song, playing his song or singing his song. Nor can those trees ever be bare because they're painted now on this urn. This is not a motion picture. You can't represent change here. Bold lover, never, never canst thou kiss Though winning near the goal, yet do not grieve, she cannot fade. Though thou hast not thy bliss, forever wilt thou love and she be fair. Okay? Speaking now to the young man who's running after the young woman, and he wants to get a kiss from her, and she's running away from him. He can never reach her. He can never reach her. But the consolation is that she will forever be fair. She'll never change. Ah, happy, happy boughs that cannot shed your leaves, as real boughs would shed their leaves in autumn. Nor ever bid the spring adieu, and happy melodist unwearied, forever piping songs forever new, more happy love, more happy, happy love, forever warm and still to be enjoyed, forever panting, forever young, all breathing human passion far above that leaves a heart high sorrowful and cloyed, a burning forehead and a parching tongue. See, nothing is ever going to change in this world of art. And there's something consoling about that because they're never going to change. They will be forever youthful. Who are these coming to the sacrifice? To what green altar? This is, would be another band with another set of images on it. O mysterious priest, leadest thou that heifer lowing at the skies? This is for a sacrifice, apparently, a religious sacrifice. And all her silken flanks with garlands dressed. What little town by river or seashore or mountain built with peaceful citadel is emptied of this folk, this pious morn? And little town, thy streets forevermore will silent be. And not a soul to tell why thou art desolate can e'er return. O attic shape. Attic, Greek, ancient Greek, shape, fair attitude, with breed of marble, of marble men and maidens overwrought. All right. With forest branches and the trodden weed, thou silent form dost tease us out of thought, as doth eternity. There's something eternal about the urn because what is depicted on the urn and in the urn is frozen. It is out of time and to be out of time is to be in eternity. That's what eternity means. Cold pastoral. A pastoral is a pastoral poem here, the urn is metaphorically treated as a pastoral poem. Pastoral goes back to the Latin word pastor, which means shepherd, which means rural, which means out in the countryside. 
So what is being represented here as in pastoral poetry dealing with people out in the countryside is this scene. When old age shall this generation waste, my generation, John Keats, when old age shall this generation waste, thou shalt remain. You'll remain. You're still going to be here. I mean, all the rest of us are going to grow old eventually and we're going to die, but you will still be here in the midst of other woe than ours, a friend to man to whom thou sayest, beauty is truth, truth beauty, that is all you know on earth and all you need to know. Well, this is one of the most famous poems in the English language, and uh, it's one of those things that you, you can just go over and over and over, and you just keep finding other little nuances and shades of meaning and you know other kinds of problems and it's you can turn it around like the like the Grecian urn and view it from many 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 different perspectives so um, I asked the question what about negative capability is that a useful concept here has Keats followed his own advice does he try to give us some sort of moral here, or does he leave it implicit? So it may be there, but it's not stated outright. And certainly, we're not hit over the head with it. Well, that's an interesting question. And for comparison, I would like to look over at to autumn, but first of all, let me put this screen up on the screen because it has uh, some of the terms that I've been using. Okay. Stasis and kinesis. These are, are actually ultimately, I mean, we've anglicized them, but they're ultimately two Greek words, stasis meaning standing in one place, and kinesis meaning in, in motion or moving. And of course, that's what's happening in the poem, isn't it? And I just give an example. There's a uh, statue of Aphrodite in our own uh, Museum of Fine Arts, up on the second level, which is an illustration of a very posed figure. And kinesis, kinesis, that's Lessing's name, by the way, the philosopher I was telling you about, on Lachowan, the statue of Lachowan and his sons, but also Rodin. Have you seen the, uh, the statuary of Rodin? We have three or four pieces in our own museum of fine arts, but uh, there are Rodins in other museums around the world. And of course, uh, if you get to Paris, there's the wonderful Musée Rodin, uh, which has some of the statues inside, but many of them are actually outside including the absolutely wonderful Burgers of Calais and the Gates of Hell. Um, and what Rodin did, and you may, you may know what I'm talking about, at least some of you I hope know what I'm talking about, is he will sometimes have a figure who is emerging out of stone, like struggling to be born out of a block of stone and is half still in the block of stone and half out which is a remarkable way of, of representing the, the kind of problem that Rodin was setting for himself. I mean, after all, he's dealing just with a block of stone, but that figure that he is struggling to create is, as it were, struggling out of the stone. Okay, now here, this is posed in a little bit different way. 
so that in our poem we have the whole issue of how these figures are apparently in motion and yet they're not in motion. The world is in motion, our world is in motion, everything changes, you and I are going to change, you and I ultimately will no longer even be here. And yet what is here, by virtue of its being static, will always be here. And the figures on the vase will always be young. So, okay, well let's, let's look at to autumn in terms of the kind of pure lyricism that Keats was trying to get in some of his most mature poetic efforts. This is one of his great odes, by the way. There are several of them, including the Ode on the Great Grecian Urn. Season of mists and mellow fruitfulness, close bosom friend of the maturing sun, conspiring with him how to load and bless with fruit the vines that round the thatch eaves run, and fill, uh, excuse me, to bend with apples the mossed cottage trees, and fill all fruit with ripeness to the core, to swell the gourd and plump the hazel shells with a sweet kernel, to set budding more and still more later flowers for the bees, until they think warm days will never cease, for summer has o'erbrimmed their clammy cells. Who hath not seen thee oft amid thy store? Sometimes whoever seeks abroad may find thee sitting careless on a granary floor, thy hair soft lifted by the winnowing, winnowing wind, or on a half-reaped furrow, sound sleep, drowsed with the fume of poppies, while thy hook spares the next swath and all its twined flowers. And sometimes, like a gleaner, thou dost keep steady thy laden head across a brook, or by a cedar press with patient look, thou watchest the last oozings hours by hours. Where are the songs of spring? Ay, where are they? Think not of them. Thou hast thy music too. While barred clouds bloom the soft dying day and touch the stubble plains with rosy hue, then in a will wailful choir the small gnats mourn among the river sallows, borne aloft, or sinking as the light wind lives or dies, and full-grown lambs loud bleat from hilly born, Hedge crickets sing, and now with trebles soft the red breast whistles from a garden croft, and gathering swallows twitter in the skies. Now, that may be as close to pure lyricism as you can get. Notice that what we have is a series of images, but we have very little attempt to suggest what the meaning of those images might be. Okay? With the exception of the beginning, perhaps, of the third stanza. Where are the songs of spring? Aye, where are they? Think not of them. Thou hast thy music too. With perhaps the implication that people tend to think, oh, how beautiful the spring is, and may not think so seriously of how beautiful the autumn is. But notice how this really does achieve a kind of negative capability. And it certainly doesn't do what he accuses Coleridge of doing, whether that's a fair criticism or not. Okay. Well, uh, 
a wonderful poet, and unfortunately, he died at 26, and as one of our editors points out, neither Chaucer, nor Shakespeare, nor Milton had accomplished anything close to what Keats had accomplished by age 26. And that has always led people to wonder what he would have accomplished had he lived. He unfortunately died of tuberculosis uh, in a time when they did not yet have any means seriously for controlling tuberculosis. And so if you got it, you were almost certainly going to die from it in Keats's time. Okay, well now let's turn over to Letitia Elizabeth Landon, who published under L-E-L, -L, under L-E-L, -L, and that became one of the most famous uh, pseudonyms, if you will, of the 19th century. Letitia Elizabeth Landon, L-E-L. -L. Now remember, in part, there weren't a whole lot of opportunities for women publishing, and so women sometimes either published under names where you couldn't tell whether it was a man or a woman, or even as in the case of George Eliot, published under a man's name, a fictitious man's name. But there were also women writers who published under their own names. Okay, let's look first at The Proud Lady. This is in a medieval ballad form, and it relates a tale from medieval romance. And this, too, is part of what happened in the Romantic period. Remember that I said in the midst of industrialization and urbanization, there were many who looked back to an earlier time and said, that is a kind of innocence that we have lost. A kind of golden age back there in the Middle Ages. So here's the proud lady, which is not unlike Keats's La Belle Dame Sans Merci, by the way, which is also a kind of version of a medieval or medieval-like ballad. The Proud Lady. Oh, what could the lady's beauty match? On it were not the lady's pride. A hundred knights from far and near wooed at that lady's side. The rose of the summer slept on her cheek, its lily upon her breast, and her eyes shone forth like the glorious star that rises the first in the west. There were some that wooed her for land and gold, and some for her noble name, and more that wooed for her loveliness, but her answer was still the same. This, of course, is going to be the woman who refuses to fall in love and refuses any lover unless the lover can accomplish an impossible or near impossible task. But, of course, the one who does you see, is supposed to get the lady, and she's supposed to fall in love with him. And this is also the famous theme of the taming of the shrew. You know, the title of Shakespeare's comedy, The Taming of the Shrew. The woman who is reticent, the woman who refuses to fall in love, and so forth, who then does. There is a steep and lofty wall where my warders trembling stand. He who at speed shall ride round its height, for him shall be my hand. You see, this is a near impossible task. Many turned away from the deed, the hope of their wooing o'er, but many a young knight mounted the steed, he never mounted more. At last there came a youthful knight from a strange and far country. The steed that he rode was white as the foam upon a stormy sea. Okay. Now, he's the one who's going to make it. The others have fallen off. They've died. They're gone. 
And she who had scorned the name of love now bowed before its might, and the lady grew meek as if disdain were not made for that stranger knight. Okay? This is an ironic twist now in, this, in the, the ballad tale. She sought at first to steal his soul by dance, song, and festival. At length on bended knee she prayed he would not ride the wall. Okay, please don't do it. Don't do it. I don't want you to be killed because now I have for the first time fallen in love. But gaily the young knight laughed at her fears and flung him on his steed. There was not a saint in the calendar that she prayed not to in her need. She dared not raise her eyes to see if heaven had granted her prayer till she heard a light step bound to her side. The gallant knight stood there. He's done it. He's won. And took the lady Adeline from her hair a jeweled band. But the knight repelled the offered gift and turned from the offered hand. She offers him, you see, this band, this jeweled band from her hair. And he refuses the gift. And deemest thou that I dared this deed, lady, for love of thee? The honor that guides the soldier's lance is mistress enough for me. So here, notice, the victorious knight not only achieved the quest, but he now triumphs over the lady by rejecting her. Enough for me to ride the ring, the victor's crown to wear, but not in honor of the eyes of any lady there. And then he reveals something. I had a brother whom I lost through thy proud cruelty, and far more was to me his love than woman's love can be. I came to triumph o'er the pride through which that brother fell. I laughed to scorn thy love and thee, and now, proud dame, farewell. And from that hour the lady pined, for love was in her heart, and on her slumber there came dreams she could not bid depart. Her eye lost all its starry light, her cheek grew wan and pale, till she hid her faded loveliness beneath the sacred veil. And she cut off her long dark hair and bade the world farewell. And she now dwells a veiled nun in St. Mary's cell. She's become a nun. Where else did she have to go? In many of the romances, by the way, at the end, if the lady is separated from her lover or whatever it may be, you know, she goes off and she lives in a convent as a nun. And then we have another poem which is very interesting, which we'll close with, which is a poem of grand passion both in falling in love and in suffering love's loss. And in this poem, there are lots of allusions to Byron. This is the passion of a female romantic hero. Not a male romantic hero, but a female romantic hero. With lots of allusions to Byron and Byron's poems. And there's a certain kind of Byronism in its passionate extremes here. Teach it me, if you can, forgetfulness, she cries. And look over in line 35 and following. But you first called, speaking to her lover, my woman's feelings forth and taught me love, ere I had dreamed love's name. I loved unconsciously. Your name was all that seemed in language, and to me the world was only made for you. You see, and I became, as it were, a kind of slave. And then in 46 and following, at last I learned my heart's deep secret, for I hoped I dreamed you loved me. Wonder, fear, delight swept my heart like a storm. 54 and following, as it was, I gave all I could, my love, my deep, my true, my fervent, faithful love, and now you bid me learn forgetfulness. It is a lesson that I soon shall learn. 
There is a home of quiet for the wretched, a somewhat dark and cold and silent rest, but still it is rest, for it is the grave. Well, after this, we have the poet, as it were, speaking in her own voice, flinging aside the scroll and saying, why should you write this? What could she write this? Her woman's pride forbade to let him look upon her heart and see it was in utter ruin, in utter ruin. So we have the poetic commentator now, who unlike the speaker at the beginning of the poem, is not naive. She is experienced and she has experienced the pain of rejection in love, but it is nonetheless painful to her. It is despair in uh, 95 and following, coiling scorpion-like, stinging itself, the heart burnt, crushed, passions earthquake scorched, withered up, lies in its desolation. This is love. Okay, that's the tale that I can tell. But the one thing she can hope for at the very end, last stanza. And here at length is somewhat of revenge for a man's most golden dreams of pride and power are vain as any woman dreams of love. Both end in weary brow and withered heart and the grave closes over those whose hopes have lain there long before. The woman who wants love and is rejected suffers greatly. But here in her cynicisms, perhaps, she takes comfort in the fact that men in their pride and ambition likewise are going to come but to the grave. So we'll pick up here next time.